Hello, you're very welcome to the Glen Storytelling Festival 2020, which, as you can see, has to be virtual this year. My name is Liz Weir, and I'm going to introduce you to three storytellers from around these parts who are going to share a range of stories and in one case, song and poem that we hope will delight you. I'd like to first of all thank the sponsors of our festival. This live stream is funded by Causeway Coast and Glens Heritage Trust. Middle East Antrim Borough Council have supported us, as have the Honourable the Irish Society. So sit back and relax. Our first storyteller is Janice Witherspoon. She lives now in Glenarm, but she's going to tell you a story that she first heard in the village of Cushendall in the heart of the Glens. Hello. This is the third Glen Storytelling Festival that I've been involved in. And normally the local storytellers, we go out to schools and nursing homes and we take our stories out there. And unfortunately, we can't do that this year. But two years ago, I was in Cushendall and I was taking stories out to schools there. And I was between schools, so I went into a cafe for a cup of coffee. And I was sitting there making notes about a story when two women, local women, sat at the table next to me. And they were kind of looking at me. And you can always tell when people are curious about you or want to know who you are. So I smiled over at them. And they said to me, are you on holiday? No, I said. I'm about to go into a school to tell stories. <gasps> stories, they said, you're a storyteller. And they started to tell me about the fairy hill of Tivera. Do you know about that, they said. Well, they told me all about it. And then words of a poem that they'd learned in school started to come back to them. And they recited this poem. And I left that cafe pleased to have met them and determined to go and learn more about Tivra Hill and the poem that I'll try and recite for you now. On Tivra Hill near Cushendall, I heard a commotion behind a wall. I stopped and looked over and boys, oh boys, what do you think was making that noise? It was a hurling match and may I choke if it wasn't two wee teams of the fairy folk. They were tearing and rippling and welting away in the light of the moon as bright as day. And their hurling pitch not half as big as my Uncle Barney's potato rig. And me stood watching them puck and clout behind the wall with my eyes stuck out. When all at once, like the squeal of a hare, a wee voice called out, who's that up there? And a bit of a thing, not nine inches tall, came climbing up to the top of the wall. And he stood there, he stood there about pot size, with his two wee fingers up at my eyes. And he stood there, and he says to me, get out of that or I'll blind ye. Aye, that's what he says. I'll blind you, says he. Well, by jing, that was enough for me. Did I run? Aye, and I did me miss. And I haven't set foot in Tivra from that day to this. And you know, they say that to this day, Nobody goes near Tivra Hill, the fairy hill, especially at night. And I only heard tell of one man who went near that hill at night. And it's his story that I'm going to tell you now. And it's the story of a blacksmith. And the blacksmith lived in his wee forge near Cushendall. 
And he had a son called Andrew. And Andrew was about 14 years old at the time of this story. And the blacksmith was passing on all the skills of the blacksmith and trade to his son. And Andrew was a quick learner. And sometimes when the day's work was done, they would take the fiddles down from the hearth and the father would play tunes for as well as all the blacksmithing skills. He was passing on the fiddle tunes to his son too. Now, Andrew, he was a good natured boy and the neighbors all loved him and he would run errands for them. And he always had a smile on his face. But in time, things changed. Andrew withdrew away into himself and, and he became, you could hardly get a word out of him. And when his father spoke to him, he just grunted. Well, you might think that that's pretty normal behavior for a 14 year old boy, but it was more than that. His appearance began to change too. He, he grew frail and feeble and, and his eyes sunk back into his sockets and sometimes there was like a deathly pallor across his face and he gave up going to the forge and you could hardly get him out of his bed in the end. Well, the blacksmith was very, very worried. He didn't want to lose his only son because he was all he had in the world. Now, the blacksmith had heard that in a grander house in the village of Cushendall, a house with servants, there lived a hen wife who looked after the poultry. And as you may know, the hen wives are the wise women and they know a thing or two. And so the blacksmith decided to take himself off to see the hen wife. Well, she knew he was coming because she had a skill she could break the white of an egg into a glass and she could see the future in it. And it was no surprise when he turned up at her doorstep. She brought him in, she gave him a cup of tea and he told her all about the changes that had come over Andrew. And the hen wife listened. Ah, she said, it sounds like maybe your Andrew is bewitched by the fairies and is a changeling. But what can I do, said the blacksmith? He's my only son and I fear he might die. Well, the hen wife told him this. She told him that he was to take a bucket of water and put it outside his back door and wait until the light of a full moon had reflected on the water. And then she gave him a big sack of eggshells and she told him that he had to fill these eggshells with the water and take them up to Andrew's bedroom. But he had to pretend that they were as heavy as rocks. Well, the blacksmith had never heard any such thing, but he would have tried anything and so he followed her instructions to the letter. He did the bucket of water, he waited for the full moon. And then to keep Andrew quiet, he gave him a big bowl of broth there in the bed. And then he began to fill the shells with the water and to carry them in and pretend and he was staggering under the weight of them and to lay them around Andrew's bed. Well, Andrew, or the creature in the bed, as this was going on, began to wheeze and to hiss and to rasp until finally out of the creature came, I am 700 years old and I never saw the like of this. Well, the blacksmith, he was back off to the hen wife as fast as his feet would carry him to tell her what had happened. Aye, she says, it sounds like indeed Andrew is a changeling. But there's one way to be sure. Light a fire in his room and take him unawares and throw him in. And if it's your Andrew, he'll call for help. You can pull him out. And if it is indeed a changeling, it'll rise like a puff of smoke through the chimney. 
Well, again, the blacksmith went home and followed her instructions to the letter, lit the fire, took the boy unawares, threw him in and disappeared up through the chimney like a puff of smoke. And the blacksmith went off to see the hen wife again the very next day to tell her what had happened. Now, she said, this is the hardest part is to get your son back. But I'll help you as much as I can. And she told him that he had to wait until May Eve, the eve of Beltana, and go up to Tivra Hill. And the fairies would be at their celebrations and he might be able to get his son Andrew back. And she gave him three things to help him. She took a Bible from the shelf, she put it under one arm. And then she went out into the yard and she got a majestic looking rooster and that went under the other. And in his hand she put an iron poker. And the blacksmith went away with these things. And he waited until May Eve. And then when night had fallen, he set out for the hill with the Bible and the rooster and the poker. Well, when he walked up the side of that hill, he began to hear music coming out of the hill. And then he realized that the door of the hill was wide open. And he rammed the poker into the side of the hill because he knew the fairy folk wouldn't touch iron. And then he looked in. Well, such celebrations as you can't imagine. The wee fairy fiddlers were fiddling away furiously and all the fairy feet were flapping around, dancing to the tunes. And at the back of the hill, there was his son, Andrew, looking as young and strong and healthy as he always had before. And the blacksmith struggled not to have a tear in his eye at the sight of his son. But then armed with his Bible and his rooster, he walked into the hill. Well, those wee fairy folk, when they saw him, they laughed and they pointed and they jeered at him. And he said he wasn't going anywhere without his son. And they laughed and they jeered even harder. But he pressed on. And just then, the rooster under his arm flew out and landed on one of the heads of the wee fairy folk and flapping its wings all around caused such a commotion that they scattered in all directions. And the blacksmith was able to walk right to the back of the hill and he gave the Bible to Andrew. Well, the moment he had the Bible in his hand, those wee fairy folk, they began to push father and son out of that hill towards the door. Push, 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 out, out, out they went until father and son were stood in the pitch dark of night. The blacksmith took the poker out of the hill and it shut behind them. And the two of them walked home. Well, for a year and a day after that, Andrew didn't say a word. He was restless. He couldn't settle. But after a year and a day, one evening, the father took the fiddle down from the hearth and began to play a tune. And Andrew joined in. He started to speak again. He became his old self again. And do you know, he even began to teach his father some new fiddle tunes. Because as I'm sure you all know, the best music comes from the fairies. Well, you know, I'm only a blow into the glens, but having lived there for 20 years, I have a healthy respect for the other crowd, the good folk, the fairies. And you know, I was in a hostelry in Cushendall. Two men were standing with their backs to me, and they'd even talk about you when you're standing behind them. They said, there's that Liz. She'd have you believing in fairies. The other boy says, do you not, John? No, a lot of nonsense. Have you not got a fairy tree in your land? I have. Would you cut it down? I wouldn't. 
So even the skeptics are very, very careful. So from a fairy tale, we're going to go to something more romantic. Colin Irwin is a storyteller and a singer-songwriter who lives near Glenarm, and he's got a lovely romantic story for you set in the beautiful glen called Glendon. I'm going to sing a song for you called uh, Beautiful Glen Dunn. It was inspired by a storytelling friend of mine, uh, Stephen O'Hara, who told me about his young life living out of the glens and coming back to his native Cushion Dunn and then having to leave again as a work, young working man and then coming back again to, to rear his family. And he inspired this song. Hope you like it. It's called Beautiful Glen Dunn. <laughs> Set off from the city streets with the promise of ice cream. Children in the back seat, Sunday clothes, traces clean. We soon ran out of nursery rhymes, nearly drove us round the bend. So we played a game to pass the time we called Sing All the Nine Glen.
first fell in love with you in beautiful Glendon. Thank you. A lovely song about a lovely place. Antrim Glens Tourism is hoping that you'll come and see these places for yourself next year when things ease up a bit. Uh, the nine glens of Antrim are truly, truly beautiful. And you know, Colin's song was a great lead-in to our next storyteller. For Stephen O'Hara does in fact live in Cushendon and he's got a story for you about a, a trickster, somebody you really need to be careful of. Hello there. At the top of beautiful Glendon, there lived a man. He was a widower, and he was trying to raise three boys on his own, and times were hard. And the three boys were as clever, as sharp as a cart load of monkeys, and they were keen to learn, and they were hard workers. And their father was in despair because he didn't know where he could get the money out of to get them a decent education. And he was going through the parish and he heard the women folk talking about Halloween that was approaching. And the local legend that said, if you walked round a rick of hay seven times on Halloween, that the devil would appear and would grant you a wish. And the poor man was in so much desperation, he decided to give it a try. And he went to the field where the hay was ricked. And at the stroke of midnight on Halloween, he circled the hay rick seven times. Now, you might have heard of the devil in other stories from across Europe, and you might have in your head a notion of this gothic, red-skinned, horned creature with a long, fiery tail. But the devil's never like that in Irish folklore. The devil in Irish folklore is a trickster, somebody that tries to outsmart you, a gambler, somebody that tries to put one over on you. And he could look like you, or he could look like me. But he popped up from behind the hayrick, and he said, you called? And the, the father said, I did. I'm in desperation. I need money and I have no way of getting it. Can you help? And the devil said, there will be a cost to such a bargain. The man said, I understand. What are your terms? He said, my terms are that I will give you sufficient money to educate your boys. But on the day that the last one of them graduates, I will come and I will take you and your soul down to hell. And the father, with a heavy heart, agreed to the deal. And by the time he reached home, there was a pot of gold on his kitchen table. And the pot of gold never seemed to exhaust. Every time he needed money, there was money there. And he sent his boys to school, and they thrived at school. And they grew into young men, and one of them qualified as a doctor, and one of them went into the priesthood, and the third son qualified as a lawyer. And then, on a dark night, with the wind blowing down the glen, a knock at the door. The father, expecting the devil, had one son with him to give him some courage during the meeting. He opened the door, and the devil came in, and he looked as handsome as he had that first night that they'd met. He hadn't aged in any way. The father was a little more stooped and some gray hair at the sides of his temples. The devil came in and said, it's time. You have to come with me. We have a bargain. Now, the son that he had with him in the room that night was the priest, and he was in his vestments. And he walked forward to the devil fearlessly, and he went down on his knees in front of him, and he pleaded, and he begged, 
He even prayed. He said, please don't take my father yet. He's led such a good life. He's brought us up to be moral and principled people. Give him a little more time. And the devil looked at the old man, and indeed he did look kindly and generous. And the devil saw that the bargain had taken its toll on him. And he was overcome with generosity. And he said, okay, I'll give him some more time. I'll come back in five years, the same night. And they breathed a sigh of relief. The devil left, and the father went on with his life. And time passed. And on exactly the same night, five years later, again, a knock on the door. The father this time with him, not the priest, but the doctor. And as the devil entered, he said, you escaped me once, but tonight's the night. Come on. And the doctor went forward and he pleaded with the devil. He said, please, just a little more time. My father has had a life of ill health. He's just recovered from a long illness. Please give him a little more life where he can enjoy some health and happiness. And the devil, aware that he had the ultimate contract that would eventually take the father with him, he said, very well, this is it, the last chance. I will come back in five years on the same night. And he did. Time passed. The old man by now looked his age. His hair was completely white. The door knocked on a stormy night in the glen, and when he opened it and entered the room, the devil saw the old man and his final son, the lawyer. And the devil said, come on, it's time to go. And the father stood up as if to leave. But the lawyer spoke up and he said, excuse me, I understand that you've reprieved my father twice, but could I ask you for one last request? And the devil said, you can ask. And the father said, this little piece of candle burning on the table, will you give him as long as it takes for that candle to burn down? And the devil looked at the candle and it was a tiny little butt of a candle and he reckoned it wasn't going to be long in it. And he said, very well, until that candle burns to the bottom, that's how long you shall have. And at that, the lawyer wet his fingers and leaned forward and snuffed out the candle. He put the tiny little stub of candle in his pocket, and that's where it remained. And the lawyer never went out of the house without that candle in his pocket for fear that somebody would pick it up and relight it. And as long as it remained unburned, his father was safe. So the devil had to leave and realize that he had to keep his side of the bargain as well. And he left without the old man. So there we have an example of the trickster and how people tried to outsmart the devil. But this story that I'm about to tell you is a wee bit different. This involves a tradition in Ireland of what is known as going under the briar. I'll explain. People in the countryside play a lot of cards. They play country games, innocent games, 45, 25, cribbage. They play it in people's houses. And it's a fine pastime for a man, as long as he doesn't become addicted to the cards, which is what happened to our fella that I'm going to tell you about. He was in the grip of the cards, and the reason was that he didn't seem able to win. He was the most unlucky man at cards you ever saw. While there was only pennies and tuppences on the table at any time, at a night, he could lose a shilling, and a shilling was a lot of money in those days. And it went on night after night, after week, after month. And he was one night so angry at having lost everything he owned that he got up and he kicked the chair away from him and he was walking out, and somebody said after him as he left, it's time you went under the briar. And he said, what's that? And he said, go under the briar. You know the tradition? And he says, no, I don't. And they said, oh, well... You know a briar that grows up and up and up and the weight of the branch curls over at the top and it grows back down to the ground and re-roots itself. It's a two-rooted briar and it will form a natural tunnel. And it's said that if you go there on Halloween night at midnight and you crawl through and you make a wish in the name of the devil, your wish will be granted. Well, our fellow's that desperate, he would try nearly anything. But there's a long way off until Halloween. So he goes home and he ponders it and he thinks about it. And he's heard the stories about doing deals in the name of the devil and that he would have to eventually pay a heavy price. 
But the cards have him in their grip and there's nothing he can do. So Halloween wears round. Midnight comes and he's there outside the cemetery, up the long wall where there's a briar patch that grows too rooted. He gets down on his hands and knees and he crawls into the tunnel. And when he's almost at the end, he stops and he waits for the flash of lightning or the burst of thunder that he expected. But nothing happens. He feels exactly the same. But then he sees something at the end of the tunnel and he crawls on out. And lying on the end of the tunnel is a pack of playing cards. Pristine, brand new, crisp, clean deck of cards in a new box. And he picks it up and he puts it in his pocket and he thinks, well, if that's all there is to making a wish in the name of the devil, it wasn't so bad. And he went home. The next evening he went to play cards. And they played cards that evening. And during the course of the evening, one of the players put his hand out and a card fell out of his sleeve. And the whole table was in an uproar. Everybody jumped up. He was accused of cheating. They counted the deck. They put the card that had been dropped into the deck and counted them. There's 51 cards. There's still a card missing. Somebody's cheating. The host of the family that's hosting the, the card game throws the pack of cards from him. They hit the wall. He says, they'll never be played with in this house again. And our fellow puts his hand in his pocket and he brings out his deck of cards and said, what about these? Well, that creates a bit of conversation around the table. That's a lovely deck of cards. Where did you get a great deck of cards like that? Boys and dears, look at that deck of cards. Aren't they beautiful? And they pass them around and they're feeling how clean and shiny the deck is. And the host says, we'll play with these. Where did you come on them? Ah, oh, I bought them somewhere. I can't remember when. Now, a deck of cards wouldn't have been a thing you bought every week. They were an expensive enough commodity that the same deck would have been played with for years. And there would have been corners turned up and bits ripped off the cards and tea spilled over the backs of them. And people got to know which card was which by the tea stains and which part of it was curled. So it was good to have a new deck. And they played. And for the first night in a long time, he won a hand, and he won two hands. And over the course of the night, he won a few hands. And, you know, he walked home that night with more money in his pocket than he arrived with for the first time, and he couldn't remember how long. So life was getting good. He came back the next evening, and the same thing happened. Over the course of several nights and several weeks, he was winning about seven hands out of every ten he played. Now... The people in the house never thought much of it, and do you know an odd time just to throw suspicion off him? He would even deliberately lose a hand so that nobody would think he was doing something improper. But a strange thing did happen in the, in the house. The card games got longer. The men who before were happy to play for an hour or maybe two hours, suddenly they wanted to play longer and they wanted to play more. And suddenly... They didn't want to play the old innocent games, 25 and 45 and cribbage. Somebody suggested poker. Now, poker was a much more serious undertaking. It had higher stakes. It was a riskier game. You could stand to lose a lot. But that's the way they played, and the games got longer, and the men got later each night home. And their wives began to complain that the cards were keeping their men out till all hours. And eventually one wife plucked up the courage and went to the parish priest, and she said, there's something funny going on at that house. They used to play cards maybe from seven till nine. Now my husband's many a night, not home till after midnight. I want you to investigate. And the priest said he would, and he asked at the house, and they told of this man and his changed luck and how unusual it was that he could win so much these days when he had won so little before. And the priest went to see him and he said, come on, hand over this deck of cards you've been using. Our fellow says, not a chance. They're mine. You're not getting them. And the priest says, you'll not be welcome in any house playing cards with that deck. You've come on them by foul means. Hand them over. Your man wouldn't hand them over. In fact, he was so determined to hold on to his cards, he moved. Him and his wife packed everything they owned up and they moved to a bigger town. And eventually the same thing happened. Suspicions were aroused and they were forced to move. Now each move became grander than the last because the more money he made, the better dwelling he had. He dressed better. His wife had a grand hat on her every time she went out the door. He had on shiny new boots and a great tweed suit. Eventually they ended up living in Dublin in a mansion with servants. 
And it came to pass that he was playing cards every night and he was making his soul living from it and he was becoming wealthy. And the Archbishop of Dublin was alerted that there was something dark happening here. And he investigated and similarly asked for the cards. Our fellow said, not a chance. And he moved. And this time he went to France. And he played in Paris. And he played in all the greatest gaming houses of Paris. And he became known to the king of France. And he played at the court. And he was ennobled. He was made an earl in France. And he lived his life. And he became wealthy. And his family was wealthy. And his fame spread. And time passed, and his life went on, and he became an old man, and he was on his deathbed when it came back to him, the consequences of the deal that he had done the night he went under the briar. So he sent for a priest. He wanted to confess. The priest arrived and listened to the story all the way back to that original Halloween night. And the priest said, I don't know what I can do for you. I can absolve you at least partially, but you'll have to hand over the cards. And he said, I understand. And he, he brought the cards out from under a pillow and he had them in a little golden box. And the priest lifted the lid of the golden box and there was the pristine deck of cards, hadn't aged, wrinkled, dirtied after years of playing. And the priest took them out of the packet and he started turning them over. And the first card was blank. The second card, nothing. The third card, white. The fourth all the way through the deck, every card in the pack was blank. Where you'd expect to see the ten of clubs or the three of diamonds, nothing. The priest was puzzled. He reached the end of the deck and the very last card, which of course was the joker, or at least should have been, the priest turned it over and he set it down. And what do you think was looking up at him off that card? The image of the devil's face looking up at him and laughing. The priest gulped took a breath, and like that, he went up in smoke and vanished from sight. The old man's heart was beaten. He looked at the deck of cards, and like that, they burst into flame. Now, I don't know what happened to that old fellow, whether he went above or whether he's in the hot place, but I can tell you, it's usually a mistake to wish for too much, because if you're not careful, you might get what you ask for. Let that be a cautionary tale. It's not too long to Halloween, so be very careful if you meet any strangers along the road. So from that story, we're going to go on to a story on down the coast a bit. We celebrate our beautiful landscape, and there are many stories of the sea as well as of the land. So Colin Irwin from Gunarm, whom you heard singing earlier, is going to share one of his original stories with us. There have been many strange tales told by the lighthouse keepers who once manned those lonely outposts all around our coasts. But perhaps none stranger than the one that you're about to hear. There are a pair of rocky islets about four miles off the Antrim coast, and they're known locally as the Maidens. And since 1829, they have been the site of a lighthouse. And at one time, two lighthouse keepers were ferried out 
every month to relieve the incoming crew. But of course, sometimes when the weather was inclement, it was unsafe to land and one month could easily drag it into two. In the month of October 1834, a mailman was sent up north to County Antrim to join up with a local lighthouse keeper, a man by the name of McAllister. And they were sent out to the Maiden's Lighthouse. At the end of their stint, the weather blew up and they were stormed in for another two weeks. When the relief crew eventually arrived, they tied up at the quay and there was no one to welcome them. They landed their gear and still no one appeared. And so the two lighthouse keepers and the skipper of the ferry made their way up to the lighthouse and a heavy sense of foreboding weighed on them. When they reached the lighthouse, the door was wide to the world. They went on into the kitchen mess and the sight that met their eyes haunted them for the rest of their days. One of the lighthouse keepers, barely recognizable as the one they called McAllister, was slumped in a chair by the table. His face was swollen, skin blue and purple and black. He had a gash in his scalp and a cut over his left eye. His nose was broken and he was as dead as a stone. A search of the lighthouse and its curtilage was commenced. Everything was neat and tidy and as it should have been, except they found a fresh seal skin in one of the outbuildings. They extended their search around the island and eventually in between two boulders, they found the Mayo man. He was insensible. His clothes were saturated, his sea boots full of water. They half dragged him, half carried him back to the lighthouse. They lit a, a fire in the kitchen, stripped him naked, draped him in blankets and placed his feet in a basin of hot water. And not a single drop of liquid or a morsel of food could they get into him and not a word of sense could they get out of him. Well, there was nothing else to do except ferry the Mayo man the corpse of McAllister and the seal skin back to Larn. The Royal Irish Constabulary District Inspector was informed and the Commissioners of Irish Lights dispatched a man called Donoghue from Dublin to investigate this strange incident. Well, he interviewed the Mayo man in hospital for a long time and at the end of it, the Mayo man asked for a priest before he could make his last confession, he died. Well, testimonies were taken from all the witnesses. And O'Donoghue made a report to the commissioners of Irish Lights. In it, he said that in all likelihood, the balance of the Mayo man's mind was disturbed by the consumption of pochin, there being a half bottle found among his possessions. It seemed that he and McAllister had had some sort of violent altercation which resulted in the local lighthouse keeper's demise. Due to the incoherent ramblings of the Mayo man and his bizarre claims, the exact circumstances could not be determined. With both lighthouse keepers dead, the inquest would be mercifully short and the matter was discreetly written off. The relatives were informed. And the only thing that changed was that the commissioners of Irish Lights decided from then on that there would have to be three lighthouse keepers on these remote outposts rather than two. Many years later, O'Donoghue, now retired, was traveling through the glens of Antrim as a tourist. And he had occasion to take lodgings in a local hostelry. And that evening, he found himself in a smoke-filled room 
in the company of some of the locals, fishermen mostly. In a nook by the fire, there was an old traveling woman, a tramp, taking shelter for the night, which was not uncommon in those days. Well, a, a drink was set before O'Donoghue. Come in, stranger, take your coat off, warm your feet by the fire. What has you in this part of the world, he was asked. Well, O'Donoghue said, I'm not exactly a stranger to these parts. Oh, said one, have you kin hereabouts? And before that drink was finished, bit by bit they had pieced together his entire breed seed and generation. By the next, they had discovered the reason for his previous visit. And by the next, they were discussing the strange circumstances that had occurred so many years before. And one of the old fishermen said, and what exactly passed between you and the mailman? And whether it was the whiskey or the genial company or the years that had passed that loosened O'Donoghue's tongue, but he gave this account. Having consumed some potchin, the mailman was restless and went for a walk around the island. Down by the shore, he saw what he thought was a naked young woman. He crept forward and he discovered a seal skin. He seized it immediately, thinking that he had surprised a silky. The young woman asked for the skin back. The male man refused. He took her by the arm and led her back to the lighthouse. He was challenged at the door by McAllister. What an under God have you done, man? I have captured a silky. And since we're marooned out here in this God-forsaken rock, we might as well take advantage of our good fortune. Unhand that poor girl. You'll bring a curse down on both of us, McAllister said. And he took his coat off and he placed it over the young woman's shoulders. But the mailman was crazed with drink and lust and he tried to push in past McAllister. McAllister was so incensed, he struck the mailman a blow and an almighty fight broke out. They were two large men and well matched and for over half an hour they treated blows and kicks and curses. At one point the mailman made at McAllister with a boat hook and then he felt a sharp pain in his back. The young woman brought a rock down between his shoulder blades. In his anger, the male man played swipe with a boot hook and caught her in the face, knocking the eye clean out of her right socket. Well, they fought to a standstill, neither being able to get the better of the other. McAllister staggered back into the kitchen and slumped in the chair where he died later that night. The mailman gathered up the seal skin and hid it in an outbuilding. He searched the island for the young woman but could find no trace of her. When he woke in the morning, he thought it had been a nightmare. But when he went into the kitchen mess and saw McAllister, he realized what he had done. He ran down to the sea, intent on drowning himself. But as he entered the water, he was surrounded by two dozen or more great gray seals. They wailed and they cried, and the male man was so terrified he withdrew and took sanctuary between two boulders, where the relief crew found him later that morning. More than that, I cannot tell you, said O'Donoghue, except that the very notion of a silky is as far-fetched as tea from China. And then the most aged of the fishermen said, but what about the seal skin, Mr. O'Donoghue? Where did that come from? Well, it seems reasonable to me that the Mayo man killed a seal or found a dead one and skinned it. A carcass was never found. It had no bearing on the case. And then from the nook by the fire, the old woman 
spoke for the first time. I say it had every bearing on the case. A murmur went around the room. The commissioner's man could feel his authority being questioned. And he said, <laughs> Madam, perhaps you would care to enlighten us. Even after all these years, she said, if that sealskin could be found, perhaps the silky to whom it belonged would come forward. Well, this was too much for O'Donoghue. Nonsense, woman, he said, utter nonsense. Find that sealskin and I will prove you wrong, sir she said. And as she spoke these words, she leaned forward into the firelight. Her shawl drew back and revealed a hideous scar and an empty eye socket. And whether O'Donoghue helped to locate the silky skin after his encounter with that old woman is not known. But let us hope that he did. Thank you. Well, that was an eerie story, and there are many, many stories told from along our coast. But I want to bring you inland a wee bit to a place called the Braid, gateway to the glens, near the slopes of Slemish Mountain, where once St. Patrick looked after, some say pigs, some say sheep. There was a couple there. Well, there were neighbours. He was called Johnny, she was called Martha. Their two farms marched each other. And they were both well on in years. Johnny was a bachelor farmer, and you know, he used to be a poacher. He used to make his own cartridges, and so blasted out his eardrums, so he could hear very little. Martha, on the other hand, had had a, a hearing loss since her early days, and her family were all grown, she was a widow woman, and they'd clubbed together to buy her one of those big old hearing aids, the first of them. She couldn't be bothered with it, she would never have it near her. Well, the story begins when one morning, Martha went out to tend her sheep and the field was empty. They must have got through a hole in the fence or maybe the slap between the fields was down. And she started walking up the lane to see if she could find her herd. She saw Johnny out plowing. He had the big plow horse and she shouted, Johnny, have you seen my sheep? Johnny couldn't hear what she was saying, but imagine she was asking what he was doing. So he pointed, plowing and plowing. She didn't hear him, so she imagined he just meant further on up the lane, so away on she walked. And sure enough, when she came over the brow of the hill, there were her sheep. She gathered in the whole flock, 20 all together, but here she noticed a wee lamb with a broken leg, and she thought, oh, do you know, that was decent that Johnny helped me find them. I'll give him that wee lamb. He'll know how to dispose of it. By the time she came back to Johnny's, he'd gone in for his dinner in the middle of the day, you know. The wireless was blasting. She blattered the door. He didn't come. She opened the door and she was standing there with a wee lamb with a broken leg. He saw it. And he imagined she was accusing him of breaking the lamb's leg. He says, she says, here you are. He says, I didn't do it. It wasn't me. Take it. It wasn't me. Ha, ha, ha. A wee lamb with a broken leg isn't good enough for you. <laughs> and they started a whole fight, a whole argument. There was a neighbour passing by, other neighbours came. Finally, it got so bad, the row was raised so much, they called for the local constable who came pedalling up on his bicycle. And he said to the him, people of your age, fighting and squabbling here, if you don't stop this, I'm taking you into the court in Ballymena. Well, they didn't hear him, so they kept on going. And the two of them landed up in the courthouse in Ballymena, Martha still carrying the lamb in her arms. Now, the judge on the bench that day well, he was well past his sell-by date. He should have been retired years before. He wore the wee half glasses, you know, and he peered over them. And each case he judged from the little he saw and the less he heard. So what he could see in front of him was a man, a woman. She seemed to be holding something white, which he imagined was a baby in a shawl. So he spoke up. How many years have you been married? 
Martha heard how many, and she thought sheep, so she said, 20, Your Honour. 20 years you've been married. You come here with this lovely child, lightly looking for a divorce, away home, and live together in peace and happiness. What did he say, said Johnny? What did he say, said Martha? The policeman said, he says you have to go home and live together. <gasps> but we're not married. You may get married. So Martha and Johnny got married. And they say that they lived in perfect peace and contentment, for neither one of them ever heard a single word the other one said. And that's the story. And that's the last of our stories for this session. We hope you've enjoyed it. I'd like to thank Colin and Stephen and Janice for sharing their tales. And we're really grateful to Causeway Coast and Glens Heritage Trust for funding this live stream event, but particularly to the staff at the Accidental Theatre in Belfast who have facilitated this. We hope you'll stay with us for the rest of the weekend with two more storytelling sessions. And this time we've taken our storytellers out along the beautiful Causeway Coastal Route, all the way from Fairhead right the way around to Ballygally, filming stories in the landscape. The films are, will show you our beautiful countryside and we hope that you'll come and see it for yourself next year. We're living, living in these very strange times. Our socially distanced storytelling, well, it's not the way we'd normally do it. But we hope you're enjoying the festival. If you'd like to contribute towards it, you can make donations on the Antrim Guns Tourism Festival site, which is www.goastories.org. But we hope you'll hang in with us for the rest of the weekend. And until then, keep telling stories, keep sharing the folklore of this land. Thank you. <laughs>